everybody. Welcome to Counterpointless. We're going to be starting a new series here on Counterpointless. We're going to be taking a look at Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Now, uh, we're definitely going to get through the first season. Whether we go any further than that is just going to depend on your guys' uh, feelings on this and audience reaction and stuff like that. Um, now, obviously, if you guys don't give a flying fuck, then this probably won't proceed much further than the first season. But uh, if you do give a flying fuck, it's going to keep going. Uh, we're going to be talking here today, um, first of all, generally about Deep Space Nine. I think it's most appropriate to ha- uh, pass the baton on to Paul because uh, Scotty and uh, I think Scotty has seen the entirety of DS9. I've seen most of the first three seasons and everything from season four on. Paul is kind of a, a new initiate into DS9. One of us. One, One of, of us. us. Yeah. Gobble, 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 gobble. So I'm just, I'm just now dipping my toe into the waters of Deep Space Nine. So I'm pretty familiar with the first six episodes that we'll be covering today. And, uh, you know, ready to kind of talk about it. I'm, I'm a fan of Star Trek, the original series, and The Next Generation. I've seen every episode of both of those. But outside of that, I've never really seen anything else. So, well, What's interesting about um, DS9 was there's, there's a two-year overlap with The Next Generation and DS9. So that's kind of a, a big part of why it was chosen to be on a space station as opposed to, like, let's have another starship. Because they already, I think the, the creators of the show already felt... They were already doing the space exploration thing. They wanted something more like they said. The inspiration was like the old western towns. Like they have the sheriff, you know. They have the fucking guy. They have you know the main characters. Um, well, you you can definitely feel it too. You can definitely feel the perspective shift here. Um, so Deep Space Nine stands out amongst the Star Trek series in that it does not take place on a big mobile starship. It takes place on a pretty much stationary star base orbiting the planet of Bajor, which at the time that the series starts is kind of a backwater, hole-in-the-wall, piece-of-shit planet that they're trying to get into the Federation, but the people there are in conflict. There's a lot of civil war, a lot of strife, and you you have to overcome that in order to join the Federation. So this outpost, um, which was once occupied by the Cardassians which is the big uh, evil race in this one, or one of them, I guess. There's probably some others that <laughs> yeah, will be... Yeah, kind of the big exactly, boogeyman the in cool season thing, one. The cool thing about Deep Space Nine is it actually is a Cardassian station. Right, so they're was, taking it's over... Not a, yeah, it's not, a, it's not something that was developed by the Federation and Starfleet. This is something that they're taking over that was actually built by the Cardassians. So it has all kinds of weird technology and bugs, and it, you know, it's, not, it's not designed for human uh, occupation. Like, um, you know, the starships that we're used to. It gives it kind of a new flavor. Um, But the Kardashians have just left the Bajoran system after they've won their uh, independence. And the Federation has decided to cooperate with the new Bajoran interim government to try and help the species get on their feet and see about getting the membership. But quickly in the first episode, that becomes a foregone conclusion anyway, because... Something happens that makes Bajor uh, a very important place. So that's kind all of, of the, a sudden. Uh, that's kind of a good reference. So that's basically the kind of where where, you, where DS9 picks up. Yeah. So before we really get into the episodes, I thought we'd talk um, somewhat about just the characters that are we're introduced to in the first six episodes. Sure. In just sort of a very general way before we start getting into uh, episode specifics and what the storylines are and how these episodes uh, hold up and stuff. Um, the principal character that we're introduced to um, is, of course, uh, Benjamin Sisko, who at this point in the series is a commander um, who is charged with uh, taking control of the station and uh, trying to um, sort of be the Federation liaison to Bajor, try to get Bajor ready to be part of the Federation, try to help them with the civil strife that they're... Um, undergoing in and uh, a, he doesn't want to do it no he's he's actually very reluctant at he, first yeah, which is kind of kind of cool it's very different from the introductions that we've gotten to the other captains up to this point both of them very gung-ho both of them very um you know uh, dutiful when it comes to their jobs both of them wanted to be in the positions that, the, that they're in yeah, and then we get benjamin cisco who has been sent to this backwater shithole 
to this, you know, uh, stripped out space station that the Cardassians looted before they left. But you, so but you can kind of understand why. Uh, the, after getting into the first episode, you'll kind of understand where the character's mindset is at. Sure. And you'll understand why he's kind of his career is kind of just in a sense. It feels like it's stalled out. So um, I, you really don't get as much of a indication of it in these episodes, but you do kind of start to see that one of the things about Cisco is he's very no nonsense. He's very different from to, any other, yeah. um, you know, captain in the series up to this point, and they make a they make it very plain in in the early episodes that he does things very differently. Um, he's very direct, um, hot tempered in a way that yeah. he, uh, none of the other. I mean, I guess Kirk was a little bit hot tempered, but he's hot tempered on a whole nother level than even Kirk was. He's kind of a hair trigger, um, type A personality, you know, um, overbearing. And uh, yeah, you get to see a lot of that in him. And it's 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 refreshing to see somebody tackling the, this from a different perspective. Yeah, he doesn't necessarily fit into the neat little Star Trek Federation box. Uh, like some of the other commanders and ca- captains and stuff we've seen. This is his son, Jake, who at this point in the series is um, pretty much just his generic kid, you know? Right. Um, yeah, he's a teenager, just gr- kind of going growing up, trying to find his place. I mean, he's put on the space station. He doesn't really know anyone. Just like, I mean, he's kind of coming in. It's, it's, it, it, they're trying to give you kind of like the kid's perspective of DS9. I would say is what J- the Jake's uh, story arc is kind of, and, and growing up on a space station, kind of grew up on the frontier, you know, having a non-traditional upbringing. He doesn't like uh, roughing it, you know, which <laughs> it's kind of hard for us to think of life on a space station as roughing it. I know, but but, uh, you but know, given in the context what he's of, used to, yeah. right? Yeah. This is kind of a shithole in the middle of nowhere. Not many kids on the station for him to, you know, hang out with and stuff. So he's no happier than his dad is about going to this backwater place. And, uh, yeah, like, like they said, he's like the child's perspective on the, on the ship. Yeah. There's not really a whole lot of character there, at least at this point. Um, this is Kira, Kira Norris. Um, she is the first officer. Yeah, she's the first officer. She's uh, the liaison between the Federation and Bajor, representing Bajor, of course. Uh, she is Bajoran. Um, she was a resistance fighter against the Cardassians. Um, she's kind of, at this point in the series, trying to adapt to a very different sort of role than the one she's traditionally been used to because she's used to being a freedom fighter. Now she's trying to be... Uh, Sort of a diplomat, an administrator, and a diplomat. Yeah, you know. someone that's kind of turned the page where she was like, "We've done this. Now we need to try to actually have a government and have a stable society." You she kind of cut we, her teeth as a personality, um, breaking the rules, and now she's kind of an enforcer of the rules. And her character, at least in these early episodes, seems to be a lot about that struggle. Yeah, that, and uh, I, I would say, I mean, conflict is palpable. I would say it's an ongoing for her character and her story arc throughout the series. Less so as it goes. Now, on. less less so, but yeah, it, it it still actually comes up even later seasons. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Refresh my memory. Bajorans were they established prior to this as um, a race? They I don't know if the, they were. Established I think very in, briefly uh, they were established a little bit in TNG. Now I think it might have been just to set this okay. series up because there was some overlap between TNG and DS9. Correct. Um, the last two seasons of um, of TNG, but she's also happening. a hothead like Cisco. So they, they're definitely two characters. That I would are say come she's even more of a hothead. Yeah, than he is. I would Which, say. you know, causes them, you know, fi- constant fireworks between them because you can't get two hotheads in the room together and expect them to fucking agree on it. Well, she also has a very anti-authoritarian streak, so you can tell the character is very difficult for her to deal with when she's overruled because right. she's second in command. And she doesn't, yeah, she doesn't like being second in command. She doesn't like playing second fiddle to the Federation, whose presence. At least in this point in the series, she's you know kind of resents. She's not even sure that that it's helpful to her people for them to be here. Yeah, so she's not even she she's based she's tasked with being the liaison between the Federation and the Bajorans, well, but she's not even really sure the Federation should be. We'll there. get into that more, but it's like they almost feel like they're trading the Cardassians for the Federation. Yeah, so, they they feel like oh you know are we just trading one one superpower for, yeah, for another yeah. master? Uh, so that's kind of a a recurring theme. Uh, in these early seasons, uh, Odo, he is a uh, shapeshifter, 
Did, uh, did, did they have a name for his species, or is it just shapeshifter? Uh, not at this point in the series, but if you, they're called changelings. Changelings, okay. Yeah, and uh, they have the ability to change. He's basically a liquid, but he can form solid shapes. He can turn into animals. He can or turn objects. into objects. Um, as far as his personality goes, he's very. It's kind of strange because even though he he can change his his shape, he's actually very mentally. Um, inflexible and rigid. Yeah, very, well, very he, rigid. He's the constable, so he's like the old west sheriff. If yeah. we're if we're going with the old west town analogy, yeah, definitely. And he, he doesn't like guns. He doesn't like to have a phaser or anything like that. Not that he needs one with his incredible powers. Um, but it's very much about the rules and order. He doesn't like things to be out of place. It's almost like he, he, he kind of follows a higher uh, system of, of what he calls justice. Because there's even a, a quote in one of these episodes where he says that, uh, you know, rules change depending on who's in control, but justice is forever. Right. So he it seems like he almost um, has allegiance to a higher sort of authority or order. Um, He's unfortunately accompanied by some really, really bad CGI in these early episodes. They try and go for that liquid metal Terminator thing yes. that was, and it, they missed the mark by a country mile. It looks awful. It yeah. does. It does not, and it does not hold up at all. No, it um, doesn't hold up. I mean, it was awful back then. I mean, I, oh, looking yeah. at it then, you know, knowing when this came out, I would have rolled my eyes at it then. So, <laughs> it's you know, it's not good. And I guess I, I was talking to the guys about that earlier, and they said that they really kind of downplay those morphing scenes a right. lot. Right. Yeah. The they don't actually. I, I feel like they don't really improve them much. They just kind of use it less because they realize eventually that I, I this kind of looks. I lame. think it gets a little bit better as, as the series goes maybe, on, but maybe a little. Um, They're never really like great though. In these early episodes, um, like from me and Scotty's perspective, I would say that the makeup is different. It is in the earlier episodes. They, his face is a little bit more gaunt. Um, the way the actor actually talks to the character yeah, his, does change. His mannerisms uh, ch- kind of change over time. It's just kind of like an, uh, the case of an actor getting more into a role and developing oh, a character yeah. a little further. The character definitely gets fleshed out a lot more. Um, but uh, yeah, Odo's an interesting character, but. Um, you know, he doesn't really have a whole. He doesn't. He doesn't really have a focus episode in this. Um, in these first uh, six that we're taking. Well, a look he, at. he does a little bit. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I guess the, the, he does in in one of them, but I mean, it's kind of the worst one. It, and yeah. It's not really a great. It's not really a great showcase for what his character we'll, can do. We'll get into that more as we talk about the. But episodes. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to the actual episodes. Um, oh, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong. Um, this is uh, oh, this Orc, is a, one of the best, characters. probably my favorite character yeah. on the show, and a good one to mention after Odo because he plays a fantastic foil to oh, Odo's stodgy, no uptight, idea. tight-ass, well, law law-abiding. That nature. was an intentional choice of the uh, showrunners. They actually tried to pair these characters up. They're two characters that were you know going to come into constant conflict with their morals or the way they act well, or the way they view the uh, the world. Odo is the lawman. Quark is the consummate criminal the ultimate con man i mean yeah, he's, it, it, he's even kind of made to look like that there you see the way he's dressing but even in these early episodes you can see that they have a begrudging respect for one another across the lines of the law they do and which is kinda, makes their dynamic all the more interesting it's they, not just a cop versus crook yeah dynamic. they have a totally interesting dynamic well, it's kind of the that. acknowledgement that you know one really can't exist without the other right so yeah. Um, yeah, Quark is amazing. Like he's he's at the center of a lot of the best moments in these early episodes, and it shows that he's going to be kind of a heartbeat character of the show. I can see why TJ likes him so much. He hasn't emerged as my favorite character yet, but we'll get to that when we get to her slash it. Um, but yeah, um, what what else can we say about Quark? I mean, he's a he's a sleaze ball that you love to hate. And hate to love, but he's you know, but he's also really a dynamic character because even though he is kind of a scumbag, there there's a good side to him. Yeah, he has a lot of redeeming character traits. I don't know if they've been explored too much in these early episodes, but um, yeah, definitely throughout the series. But just totally obsessed with profit, totally obsessed like like the Ferengi are, just obsessed with making money. He's really he, the prototypical Ferengi, just always yeah. chasing the gold pressed latinum. Yeah, which is the currency of uh, their people and all that. Um, 
just going to go briefly into Nog, who doesn't play a major role in this. Kind of just Jake's buddy. He's a nephew of uh, of Quark's, correct? Quark's nephew and Jake's uh, friend. Um, you know, there's not a lot of children on the station to play with, so he kind of uh, befriends this Ferengi boy, Jake does. And uh, Cisco doesn't like it. Because he thinks the kid's a bad influence, which he probably is. Neither does Nogs. Yeah, they both feel like, oh, you know, you're going to contaminate. You know, you know, you, the the Ferengis feel like Nog is going to be basically the, sh- the shit. You know, so with, does, where you know, uh, like Cisco. kids are acting up, and both parents are like, it's not you, it's a, your bad influence friend. You know, right. right? Exactly. We just think your friend is a bad influence on you. It's not just no you way, being curious. There's naturally. no way that you made these choices. <laughs> um. But yeah, not a whole lot of development here, but uh, I, I think, you know, if we get far enough into the series, he'll definitely, we'll definitely have more to say about Nog as a character. Um, Bashir, Paul, you had some strong feelings. Uh, yeah, this is the Wesley Crusher of Deep Space Nine. Um, he is the most annoying character on the space station by a country mile. He sucks. He's perpetually bewildered. He's like the dork that doesn't know anything. He uh, comes to the station because he wants to act out his little Wild West fantasy. I want to be in this remote outpost and be like a gunslinger, you know, well, doctor. We're talking about a frontier medicine. You right, know. frontier medicine, you know, rootin' tootin' doctor on the frontier. Yeah, and his, he just sucks. His he character's overbearing. He do, he's overbearing, and he doesn't get anything in a way that just makes you think he has a hard time picking up on social cues. Like, he just doesn't understand what's going on even when it's right in his face. And you want to grab him through the screen and shake him. Just basically, like I said, Wesley Crusher. Um, I feel the same way about him that I feel about Wesley. Just always in trouble because he's too dumb to know what's going on. What do you think about Dr. Bashir, TJ? Well, I mean, I think think from the perspective of the episodes in this early season, I think Paul's right. I do think that they do much more interesting things. I think they make him better as time goes on, but I I can still see why a lot of people really don't like the character, especially in the first season, because he was really poorly written. I, I mean, mean, you guys were telling me that people were lobbying to have him removed from the show. Yeah. Oh, yeah, dude. There they, was actually, uh, yeah, there was a, per, the, the the studio even wanted to capitulate to it, but the uh, the creators were like, no, we have a plan for this character. We want to show this development. So there, there might have been a plan all along to kind of introduce him as this character that you don't really like, and then slowly kind of, you know, transforming him. Um, well, if that's the case, it, 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 it's working on me. I do not like him six episodes in. I'm actually eight episodes in on my watch through. So His other major thing is his just constant dogged pursuit of uh, Dax. But that, it, that's it's kind not of like, just her, though. He's horn dogging all over the place. Oh, no, he's, he's, always, not, he's definitely doing that, I'm saying. But that's like kind of like the main... That, that's important to his, is The first season arc is Permanent really boner poking out of his uniform. I mean, and yeah. that just makes me hate him less because Jax, uh, Dax is mine, dude. Dax belongs to Paul. Yep, Speaking she's of mine. Dax, here she is. I this is the most interesting character to me in the show so far because her species is the most interesting. So she's a a joined species. True. So she um, is a actually two beings in one. She is Jadzia, who is this outward appearance, yeah, but- who was a young woman who grew up on her own without being joined. And then she is Dax, who is this worm-like creature that's inside of her that has integrated with her nervous yeah, system. Symbiont. So that yeah, it's a symbiont they call it. Um, and uh, they, they, so they're basically one personality shared between two separate minds. But also all the past uh, hosts for uh, Dax as well. So it's like she's basically living almost like, uh, like you said, that she has her own, she has her own thoughts, she's her own person. But also the Dax thing and all the other past lives are all mixed in there. So it's like it's almost living the life of like nine people in a way because she's all these experience and all these memories to draw from. Right. So the Dax symbiont that's inside of her has been in multiple bodies over the course of its lifespan. The last one was a man. So, you know, she has all of these old life experiences from her symbiont plus the mind of a 24, 25 year old woman, which is what she is in this, in this show. Really interesting character. She's really stoic and, and quiet and calm and peaceful, almost monk-like in her behavior. She's dispassionate, doesn't get um, flustered very easily, if at all, at least in these first six episodes. Um, 
but really manages to, at least to me, to be a standout character in the show. Just really interesting species. She just brings a nice aura to things. I don't know. It's, it's just like a. Uh, What's well, it's, it's a Spock-like aura. Well, it, it, yeah, it's unique because it's an alien. And it's di- but it's different enough where it's actually like this is interesting without having to go all with all the prosthetics and makeup and everything and trying to make it totally different. It's different enough, and that's kind of the interesting point because like, you know you're having all this experience, you know, and it's not something that's really done a lot. You know, just doing the generic alien is kind of easy, and it's really they've really done it well with this character. It's not just a generic alien; it's actually a complex, multi-layered alien with all these different lives and personality traits, and it's just really a great addition to I think the it's show. It's kind of cool that. Uh her previous host or previous life was Curzon Dax, which was uh, a good a friend of Cisco's, and, and yeah, friend of Cisco's. Uh, so it's almost like when they meet each other, they kind of know each other, but on one level, they don't. Well, Cisco calls her old man all the time. Yeah. So, and and she can remember as Jadzia Dax the friendship that she had as Curzon Dax with. Cisco, and so there's history there, but not, and that's actually explored in some of the early episodes. Not quite one that we'll get well, to today. Well, but. it's also interesting too because you know it's going from like you said the role of mentor to someone that's actually a subordinate, right? So like, it, 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 well, they actually do cover that a little bit in one of the episodes, like Paul said, but it, it, it's developed throughout the series. Just an interesting character, yes, okay. and a looker. Oh yeah, for sure. So this is a uh, TNG holdover that they brought over. Yeah, Cole Meany was uh, not a big actor when he was cast as the transporter chief on uh, TNG, but uh, somewhere along the line, he started to get some major film roles and be kind of be known as a character actor. So it's it's really no wonder that they decided to expand his his role and give him a bigger part on DS Nine. And he, I think he's a really good sort of. Um, working class every man sort of character that people can relate to he's very different than i would have imagined him from the little bit of character development because he was not a big character on on the next generation no, i mean he he had it he was big in a few episodes but not part of the primary cast really just kind of a side guy that was there and he gets a very very you know full treatment in this as and and a big uh, upgrade to his status as well as chief engineer of the space station so he's gone from the dude that was just in charge of beaming people up to the dude that's in charge of fixing everything on the station yeah and uh, you know they 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 give him uh, this very like sort of haggard um, thing where like because the station the space station like we said is a Cardassian station so things are constantly going wrong with it. Um, it yeah, in the first season, he doesn't bit, integrate well with Federation technology. Yeah. So he's constantly fixing problems. He's constantly overworked and overburdened. But you know, keeping a pretty good attitude. Well, about they, it. I mean, they really. They, I, I agree with you. He's definitely a great everyman character. They really strike that home with a number of episodes, especially early on. Like he's running around. You know, he's having all kinds of problems that you would really expect. So he's really kind of the character that's kind of meant to relate to people and, and watching the show. But he's also he's also got a very a distinct moral compass that shows itself very early in the show that isn't the same as everybody else's. He's got his own ideas of right and wrong. So they do a very good job in these early episodes of making a character that was basically just a running Scotty gag from the original series you know what i mean where yeah. oh scottish transporter chief guy i'm giving her all she's got captain and all that bullshit and he's he's definitely treated much better in this he's an interesting character he really is he's a rule breaker like i said he's guided by his own little uh, internal compass like a lot of these characters are that's something that is true from character to character but his is distinct and i like him in this show um garrick he's not a uh, part of the 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 main main cast, but he's a strong recurring character that I always enjoy he, seeing on screen. Eric, I will say this, and this is very rare for a character, but I've never seen. He's never been an episode or a scene or anything where you don't feel like the actor is a hundred percent, ten ten percent committed to this. And, just, and and it just shows and it, the uh, Andrew Robinson, the guy that plays Eric, t- totally shines throughout the entire series. Some of the most memorable lines in the episodes. Or episodes that center around this character. I mean, and he's great, too, because he's a Cardassian, right? He's the last remaining Cardassian on the space station after they were kicked out. And 
obviously he's the eyes and ears of the Cardassian Empire on on the ship. But he's unlike the rest of the Cardassians. When we're introduced to them, they're always very Klingon-like in the way that they address people. You know, they're very um, warlike and, you know, you blah, you will do this and I will do that. And he's, you can see him here. He puts on this charm. You know, he's very expressive in a way that they aren't. But I think he does that to ingratiate himself to the other people on the on the space station. Yeah. He realizes that these other aliens aren't like Kardashians in that, you know, very blunt, direct way. And so he puts on an act for them. And he puts the song and dance and he puts on the friendly smile, but it never really looks friendly coming from him. He, try, try as he might to give you a, a smile that looks like a friend. It, it, it just looks like well, a guy well, that's trying to put on can, a smile. Yeah, well, that, just, but that's the subtlety of it. sense the sort of like darkness and shit within him. And, oh, yeah, for sure. But that's why it's beautifully played, because in a sense, you know, he's putting on an act, but he wants you also. He also wants them to know he's putting on an act. Right. He's not exp- displaying genuine affection. He's displaying what they think they want to see as genuine affection so he's putting on the big smile and he's overly friendly and overly courteous and but i I think that scotty's right though that he's doing it all with kind of a wink oh yeah like you know basically like you know this is bullshit but i'm still gonna put on this this over the top personality almost as like a a parody of you and And it seems it seems like most everybody on the ship gets it except for bashir (laughs) who's a total dolt (laughs) but whatever uh, and there is some, you know, as much as uh, you don't like Bashir, I think that there is an interesting dynamic between uh, Garrick and Bashir in these uh, these episodes. I mean, he was necessary to kind of introduce Garrick's character. It's a great um, scene, despite my distaste. When when Garrick is introduced, he's introduced via Bashir, right, and well, it's a great uh, scene. Let's, let's just get into the episode, since I can tell that everyone's kind of, like, anxious to talk about specific oh, plot yeah. points and shit. Sure. Uh, so this... Uh, First episode we're going to talk about is uh, a two-parter, Emissary Part 1 and 2. This is the introductory episode. We see um, Cisco um, aboard a, you know, a ship fighting in uh, the, um, against the Borg at, uh, at, at Wolf 359. Correct. Bark, bark, shut up. Um, so then... You know, obviously, this is when Picard is assimilated by the collective, and he's Lacutus of Borg. He's blast. You know, he's leading the 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 cube into Federation space. They're destroying all sorts of Federation ships. Tons of Federation yeah, the, ships well, basically being destroyed. The, the, the fleet is being the Borg. Cisco is on one of those ships. So is his wife and his child. Um, his wife is uh, killed in the attack. Uh, Paul, you said you had a specific sort of affinity for a, a, a scene that they shot in here. Actually, a special effects shot. I mean, there was a great cinematic moment at the opening of this series where, you know, you get to see the Battle of Wolf 359. You get to see Locutus destroying the, the Federation fleet. And um, Cisco's the captain of the Saratoga at this time, and it's been badly damaged, and he's trying to escort people off the ship. His wife dies. He has to leave her body behind. He barely well, escapes. Well, Cisco is not a captain at this point. Cisco is serving on... Uh, right, a commander. Yeah, right. correct. Got it. Um, and he gets his he gets off of the thing, and there's this great shot with him sitting in front of a window on the escape pod, where they hit the button oh, to, yeah. to jettison the escape pod, and you get to see how fast the ship gets small behind him. It just and then it blows up. It's a beautifully conceived shot. He doesn't even look at it when it happens. It just happens yeah, kind of over do this his really head. Great thing where they show the ship blow up. And the perspective on it is a, amazing. They cut to a thing of his his reflection. In the window, you can see the stars, and you can also see the reflection of the explosion, and he's not even looking. He's just kind of looking down, dejected. I mean, it was I really mean, kind of like a—it made me catch my breath seeing how fast that—you know, like, it was just a beautifully conceived shot. Would have been right at home in a big-budget Hollywood movie. I mean, really came out the gate strong with that. Well, an important scene on the ship, too, is, is, is the scene, because this comes into play later, about— you see his wife die, and he's trying to save her. It's totally in vain. You can tell she's clearly dead. You know, the ship is falling apart. The, 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 the warp core, or whatever the fucking thing is going to blow. He's able to save his son. And it's kind of a moment that, in a sense, he gets kind of stuck in. Uh, yeah, and there was a great... Uh, you, you see here that we have uh, Picard and Cisco on the screen at the same time. They have an interesting relationship Um, Not what you would expect as a torch pass. Yeah, because of uh, the fact that, you know, Picard led 
the Borg cube. I mean, he was assimilated by the Borg, but he led the Borg into Federation space. So when Picard and Cisco meet for the first time, you know, Cisco was like mentions, you know, you know, didn't think I'd see you again so soon or something like that. And Picard's like, have we met before? He's like, yeah, Wolf 359. And Picard yeah. instantly knows, like, oh, shit, you know, this guy <clears throat> does not like me. But they don't they don't get along at all. And I think it was a brilliant way for the series to establish that this is a different commander than we're, we're used to. Um, Cisco is not Picard. Picard is not Cisco. They don't really like each other at the top of this. You can tell that Picard is put off by the fact that Cisco seems to not understand that he was not in control of his faculties as Locutus. And, um, you know, Cisco is not having any of fucking Picard's bullshit either. He he looks at him as responsible for killing his wife and destroying his ship. And I mean, it's barely restrained yeah. anger. And he's he's only restraining it because of the chain of command because he respects his duty as a as a subordinate officer to Picard. But he's definitely not happy about Picard being in charge of his expedition there. And Cisco even tells Picard at the beginning of this episode, you know, I don't really want this fucking post. I'm thinking about going back to civilian life. You know, and Picard's like, okay, well, if that's how you feel, I'll tell Starfleet and shit. Um, now, um, towards the end of the episode, that relationship changes a little bit where, you know, Cisco tells Picard, I actually do want this post. And Picard's like, I don't know if I should even say that. And Cisco's just kind of like, I know I really want it. Looks him in the eye. They kind of have this moment of like, you know, nothing needs to be said. All they need to do is look at each other and, and Picard's they understand. like, okay. But they don't leave that 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 uh, interchange as pals either. I like they how they don't betray the... No, they don't, they're, they're, they're they don't give respect. each other a big hug and have some emotional catharsis. They're, it's just kind of like from man to man, a moment of respect and a moment of wordless communication where Cisco is basically telling Picard, no, I'm really serious about this, and Picard being like, I respect that, and I'm not going to say anything to Starfleet about you wanting to quit. So, beyond establishing the characters, most of the characters that we've talked about already briefly, this two-part episode is basically to establish the importance of the Deep Space Nine space station while giving you a taste of who's living on it. Yes. At the beginning, like I said before, it's a backwater shithole station in the middle of nowhere that, you know, has no real commerce uh, with an any undesirable other. undesirable assignment. Yeah, it's way out in, you know, the, the, the edge of nowhere, basically. And um, very early on, there is a wormhole that opens up near the space station, near the Bajoran planet. The first stable well, wormhole. What, ha what happens is that they go down, as Bajor is on the brink of civil war. Cisco is trying desperately to say to stop and to prevent it, and he's basically told by Kira that you need to find the uh, the Kai or what is it, uh, Kalpaka. You need to go seek her out, find her. She's the only person that can unite Bajor because the only thing we have in common because there's all these factions fighting is our religious beliefs because Bajorans are very religious. So he's okay. I'm going to seek her out. He seeks her out. He basically finds out that with, with his paw, his life force, what his, his goal is. He really needs to go and find this wormhole. So he looks in this orb of prophecy. The celestial or, temple. Yeah, the celestial temple. Yeah. So he has to look. What is it? The orb of prophecy or something? Or they've got an them? orb, and the Cardassians stole eight of the other ones, yeah. and they're all relics of some ancient civilization. That eventually, through sniffing around, they find this wormhole. Yeah, the wormhole. And it's a stable wormhole, meaning that they've discovered other wormholes, but eventually they collapse under their own weight and disappear. So it's not really useful for traveling through. But this wormhole remains open, and it goes to the Gamma Quadrant which is a big area of expansion, a big military area right now, like between a lot of the different factions. So having that pipeline from this area to that makes Bajor a valuable commodity world, and it brings commerce and all of this shit that would normally have not come to the planet. But the reason it's a stable wormhole is that it's created by a species that lives in an extra dimensional plane, basically doesn't experience time linearly. And Cisco has to come to terms with them. He has to have first contact with the species that created this wormhole and try and convince them to allow it to stay open for trade and commerce. I love the way that they're called the prophets by the Bajorans. Um, uh, I love the, the way they, they refer, refer to them as the uh, wormhole aliens. Yeah, the wormhole, the, the, the Starfleet calls them the wormhole aliens. And they're not the corporeal. Bajorans call them the prophets. They're, act, they're, they're right. yeah, they, they actually do not exist in that sense. 
Well, they they like the way they communicate is they kind of use your own memories and stuff to uh, talk to you through the appearance and voices of people you've known in your life. Uh, they don't have a concept of linear time. So Cisco actually has to explain to them what time is and De- what, what it means what death to, is. to be born and to live a life and to die because they have no concept of that. They just experience they all time at once. They just experience the totality of their existence at every phase simultaneously. Uh, and they end up acting as like a psychologist for Cisco as in order to make the connection with this species and convince them to keep their wormhole open so that it can be used. He has to face his own demons and he's confronted with, um, you know, the, the death of his wife. Which they, which they keep going back to say, you're here. And he, right. and he's kind of, he keeps denying it. And they Why actually, do like, you exist here? Right. Which is basically, the, which is the yeah. scene in the beginning where his wife is dead. And they're saying, basically, you know, if why, you're, why do you dwell on this? Right. If time is linear and you've already experienced this and you're moved on, then why are you still here? And he has to confront that he, you know, part of him died that day and that he kind of gave up that day and find it within him to want to do this job. And he really finds that through the help of those aliens while simultaneously convincing them to keep their wormhole open, making Bajor a hot commodity planet and a big strategic place for the Federation and its enemies. So he gets assigned to this backwater post, but very quickly he makes a discovery that makes it not so backwater anymore. And, now and the, title, a, the title now of this episode is of The Emissary, which, strategic which, is, importance, yes. which later comes into play Throughout the entire series. Well, Cisco, find, Cisco is named as the emissary. Yeah. You really don't understand what that is at this point in the series. You're kind of but, like, what does that mean? But, you know, it's actually, he's very important. And we'll all say that... He, it's, it's interesting the way that they got Cisco... Because, you know, you usually see these captains as being like, oh, they don't really get involved, and they're not really part of... But Cisco actually becomes a big part of the religious culture of Bajor at some point. At first, um, very reluctantly, and reluctantly very, at first, and then later on, embracing his role. But that's. But way I would also add to the uh, the thing where he does appeal to the aliens is the Bajorans because they actually the these the celestial uh, beings actually do care about Bajor. Right. And that's also kind of why they grant it because he's like, if you want to help Bajor, you need to do something about it. And that's kind of their way of helping Bajor, too. I mean, while all this central plot line is going along, we're being introduced to the conflicts between all of the other little characters that we've gone through on the space station. So it's a very complex episode. Definitely right. needed to be a two-parter. It's your oh, introduction yeah. to the dynamics between these characters, Odo and Quark, now, Kira uh, and Cisco. One thing that was Paul was, uh, was talking to me about the other day was that uh, in this episode, Kira... Kira has a different hairstyle than she does throughout the rest of the series. Yeah. She actually has this uh, sort of shoulder length, um, kind of very primped uh, hair. Yep. That I guess the actress herself um, basically told them, like, this hair does not make sense for this character. Yeah. Um, she 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 was like, you know, I, I demand that they change this because it just didn't look right. She felt like the character, the hair looked like something, you know, very feminine that you would have to get up and primp and do. And she said she felt like the character isn't a character basically that would have a curling iron I, and blow dryer yeah, and shit. I, agree. <laughs> I think that she's she was 100% right on that and that was a good call on her part and good on them for listening. I don't know how hard she had to push for that, but it was worth pushing. It definitely for. suits her character better. She's got like uh, after this episode very short cropped hair, very sensible utilitarian haircut, pixie style, you so, know. So, uh, what would you say was your overall impression of uh, of this episode in terms of um, just how much did you enjoy it? Was it was it a good introduction? Do you think to it was this? a good introduction? I mean, I thought it was series? a fantastic introduction. I felt like I wanted to know more about these characters, so it's really a good start for the series. I can tell a lot of thought went into it. It's a very, I mean, we could spend probably this whole video just talking about these opening. Oh, I mean, it's a very complex, interwoven story. I mean, these first two episodes. I mean, even if you read a summary, the summary is long. But it introduces you to what you know. I think is the, at the heart of this series, which is at the heart of every Star Trek series, which is moral ambiguity and prejudice. And that's really what this show is about, at least in these first six or eight episodes. Um, it's about how these different 
uh, species deal with one another in commerce, in justice, in terms of, you know, social norms. They're all kind of forced into this big melting pot where they don't have that guiding agenda that we have in these other ones of we're all federation officers, so we all work for a common goal. You've got different agendas, people that aren't really on one side of the conflict or the other. And um, it's all it's all really well established but in this it first examines, episode. It examines in a way that's not overly preachy, which is what they like about Star Trek. A lot of series fail to do that. It just becomes like, you shouldn't do this, or this should be your moral, the moral uh, takeaway from this. Like, it doesn't really do that. It kind of... You, you see the Federation stance, and you also get to see the other perspectives a lot, too. So it is, it is more balanced. Yeah, it's like, this in, is our um, culture, this is our civilization, this is how we I, do things. As much as I like TNG, there was always this sort of um, notion of the morally righteous federation going around telling the rest of the galaxy what's what you don't get that in uh, in ds9 there's much more of a let's come to the table as equals there, there, there's a there, there's a gradient there's a there's a much there, there's much more of a gradient they have to do that they're, they're forced to come to the table with one another anyway which... let's talk uh, i know we could probably talk more at length about emissary but let's talk about the uh the third episode of the season past prologue past prologue and so this, this is, is much more this is about giving kira some uh additional development and really kind of putting center stage her struggle uh, yeah her struggle between uh, am, her past. I, am I this freedom fighter? Am I this terrorist? Do I or, or am I? Am I an administrator? Am I an administrator? Am I a uh, liaison to the Federation? Am I a supporter of the provisional government? I mean, they really push it forward. Like in the first episodes, they really establish this conflict between Kira and Cisco. They do not like each other. They have very different ideas about what the space station is there to do. Very different approaches. They're like oil and water. She even describes their relationship she as does. oil and water in this, in this episode. episode. Yeah. Um, and then uh, this dude you see here with her, another Bajoran, a freedom fighter or terrorist, depending on your uh, perspective. Now a terrorist, now that the Bajoran uh, provisional government has taken over, he's considered to be part of a fringe group. But they have ties. They work together during the fight for independence from the Cardassians. And he shows up on the scene. Um with Kardashians wanting to extradite him for crimes against them, and now he and now he's basically professed, "I've changed. I want to. I want to stop the violence. I want to change everything. And you know, I basically want to become like you." Right. He I asked for political asylum on Deep Space Nine, and there's a big conflict there because you got to remember, Deep Space Nine is brand new. Uh, in terms of this uh, federation government doesn't isn't really well defended at this point and the kardashians still have a strong presence in the sector so they're kind of bullying deep space nine in this episode to give over this prisoner and cisco is uh you know trying to walk that legal line of offering him asylum um but as we find out in the episode, his um, his intentions are not as pure as he makes them out to be. Yeah, and he's constantly pushing but pushing Kira's buttons, trying to get her to um, feel like a sellout, feel like she's lost um, that that. The spirit, that, that, that yeah. true spirit of uh, of Bajoran freedom. Like you know, we, we, you know, like we want true freedom. The Federation is just another fucking Cardassia, just Cardassia two point oh. It's just the same. We want true freedom. We want true yeah, independence. True independence. He's basically a xenophobe. He doesn't want. He doesn't want. Uh, he doesn't want any outside interference. He doesn't want Bajor to be powerful in the region. He doesn't want it to be a, a superpower. What he wants is for it to be isolationist for its culture to be sort of separate from the rest of uh, the galaxy. He doesn't want it to be part of the, uh, the you know, you know intergalactic community or whatever. Part the of the Federation. Yeah, he definitely doesn't want to be part of the Federation. He doesn't, but he doesn't want any sort of alien inter no, interference. None. He wants it to be very isolationist. Um, and, but part, uh, a part of it's the mistrust because the Cardassians have exploited right. Bajor for the last 60 years. So a lot of people have grown and up knowing could, nothing but just, you know, Basically, yeah. and a, you a tyrannical government. Part of her agrees with him, but part of her doesn't. And you know, it's that it's it's just about playing on that conflict within herself of which side is she ultimately going to choose. Right. So she eventually chooses um, the Federation side after a long deliberative process, and actually choosing against the Federation at one point 
she sees the error of her ways and we find out that his plan all along was to use a bomb to collapse the wormhole so that it would no longer be a strategic advantage point for any of the empires and that they could go back and you know develop Bajoran's uh, society for Bajorans. But I think as a character she kind of realizes that uh, like that he's kind of being naive in a way. You know, he can he, he can do these little pot shots like oh, I'm going to blow this up I'm going to do this, but the writing's on the wall. She sees the, the potential the, for the, the federa- what the, but the, the thing is if the federation doesn't move in then it's just the Cardassians again. It's just right. it's just another time where somebody else, someone else, you know, she recognizes the power the, the power behind being part of a larger you know collective. Right. And the Federation offers a lot more freedom and actually the ability for them to have a distinct culture. Whereas yep. Cardassia, you're, there's no way you're getting that. You're just getting your planet mine for resources. So this was a very good episode for Kira and a, and, a, and a decent episode. I mean, it, it it's definitely nowhere near as good as the opener. No. Um, but it's a decent episode. Very necessary for her character to know where her loyalties lie. This is also, by the way, Paul, where you could talk about Garrick if you wanted, because this is where he's introduced. So, yeah, and I mean, this is really like, so Garrick has this great introduction scene where he talks to Dr. Bashir, who's this wide-eyed, you know, dork of a character, and he's being very sleazy and very slimy, and he's trying to help this doctor with information about this terrorist plot that this dude here standing behind Kira is plotting. But he's trying to do it in a discreet way so that it's not all out on the street. And Bashir doesn't get it. There's this great scene where Bashir goes into ops where all the main characters are going about their their jobs. And he goes, you know, basically, to paraphrase, he's like, guys, guys, I think that Cardassian Garrick is a spy. And they're just, they all just kind of chuckle because they're just like, no shit. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, they're rolling their eyes at him and shit. <laughs> and they tell him, you know, you can't really assume that, but, you know, whatever. It, it, it's basically a, a kind way of telling him, like, wow, like, yeah, that's the first thing we thought of and we're all aware of this already. And I think it's funny that it took you this long to catch on to that. But, um, yeah, Garrick and, and Bashir have a pretty cool interplay in this. Bashir actually gets to help out a little bit with exposing the plot. Well, th- the reason Bashir kind of Basically, does work in the, but Garrick, d- d- does work in the naive role is because you kind of need that because everyone else is too wary to actually trust Garrick or have anything to do with him. Right. So it, it is kind of the way that Garrick is able to communicate with the Federation because the other people are, are smart enough to realize that they don't want anything to do with Garrick. He's not trustworthy. But Bashir is kind of the one guy where it's like, I think I shouldn't trust him, but I, I'm curious enough to take the plunge and yeah. see what is this all about. I'm too naive to know yeah. better. So, anything else about this one, or can we move on to episode four? Uh, not four? really. Th- th- I think we've covered it pretty well. Yeah. Uh, episode four is called A Man Alone, and um, I don't really think much of this episode, unfortunately. Yeah, this is the first kind of speed bump episode, in my opinion. Um, it's kind of a, the first spotlight that Odo gets as a character, unfortunately. Uh, but it's basically a murder mystery episode. Um, yeah. uh, and you know, maybe if the mystery had been a little better, it would have worked. But unfortunately, or the, the pay- twist that explains yeah, yeah, the, the mystery, the payoff, the, payoff is, the payoff is dog shit. So uh, there's a there's a Bajoran guy with shady connections that gets killed on the station, and he's in a place where only a shapeshifter could have gotten to him. Well, basically, what happens is this guy is on the station. Od- uh, you know, Odo is sitting at Quark's bar. He sees him. They have this big conf- public confrontation. Is like, you better be off the station. I have the ability to throw you off. You can't be here. You know, Sis kind of intervenes like unless he's broken the laws of you know the Federation or the station, he, he can stay. You can't arbitrarily throw someone off, and that so that's kind of the setup for it. And then it's oh, Odo must have killed him. He was is in a hollow suite. The door was locked, and then he was killed. So you get this very heavy-handed uh, prejudice narrative in this where. You know, everybody thinks that Odo killed this Ibu Don yeah, character, just guilty. and uh, everybody on the station basically turns against Odo, except for the main characters. But all the uh, little people living on the station all kind of form a mob, and they're you know they back him into a corner at one point, and they're howling for his blood. You know, they're just chanting "Shifter, Shifter, Shifter." You know, it's a torches and pitchforks moment. Um, and then it, you know the, the the big twist is is that the Ibu Don guy was just a clone. And they find this out by finding some weird DNA and growing it in the lab, and it turns into yet another clone of Ibu Don. So they figured out that, but it but it raises a moral question that's never really answered, because on one hand they're like, oh, there, it wasn't a murder because it was just a clone that was murdered. But then on the other hand, the one that they're growing in the petri dish, there's a scene where they literally say, like, in two in two more days he'll be a full fledged member of the Bajoran Empire. 
You know, and it's just like, what? So wait a minute. These clones are people, but they aren't. Whatever. This episode doesn't care to answer that moral conundrum for you. It just uses the clone as a MacGuffin at the end to explain away the murder. Yeah, it's like he murdered him. Now he's going, he murdered the clone. So I guess he's, <coughs> you can't murder a clone even if then. So he's going to prison, whatever. It's kind of just resolved that way. It's just not that great I mean, of an episode. I don't know. It's just not... It's, it's just not the, interesting. The tension's not great. The, no, the, the persecution pa- shit is so heavy handed. It, it, it just feels like, it, and it feels like it wraps up way too fast. Like, it, I mean, like I know these are all about forty five minutes. Just doesn't it doesn't it, really do much to develop Odo's character. It's no. not a great vehicle for for him. Maybe it was just because it's an early attempt well, it, at it, giving it, him an episode. Well, it, it gave him an attempt to show like his detective skills. You know, right. even though even though he's the primary suspect, so it's I, I could see how it, it would seem interesting on its face, but the execution and the storyline just does it doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't, it's just weak compared to the episode. It's not that a great episode. It. It's I mean, it's watchable enough if you're yeah, just if you've never like, seen it, I would watch it. But whatever, I mean, if you just want to sit down and eat a bowl of macaroni and cheese and turn your brain off, yeah. I guess you could do worse. Uh, the next episode we're going to talk about is an episode that is also not super great, but. I don't think it's as bad as A Man Alone. This is uh, Babel, right? Uh, it's called yep. Babel. Yeah, this one is, uh, I mean, i got to be honest with you, it's still weak for me. Uh, the, the big uh, MacGuffin in this one is there's a virus that breaks out on the ship that makes people aphasic. Yeah. Gives them aphasia, which means that they can't, the language center of their brain can't process language, but they maintain all of their faculties otherwise. And Robitussin, people, nuclear pimple. Right. You know, like everyone everyone just starts talking gibberish because they, their mind, there's a virus that's keeping their mind from having the right associations well, with words and concepts. It and starts things. off because the chief here triggers a virus that goes through the, the basically the um, food replicators at the station. And then a quark, because his replicators are broken, go, finds out that uh, everything on the command level is working. So he helps propagate and spread the virus. And then just each character, I think Paul said it best. It, it's kind of just waiting for each character to start talking nonsense. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, the it, it really s- plays this yeah. up too much. Like every character that we've mentioned has a has a scene in this episode where they're talking normally. They're like, we've got to isolate the, the DNA strands. And then somebody's also like, how do we do it? And they're like, purple monkey dishwasher butt plug. <laughs> oh, no. Like, oh, no, he's got it too. You know, and it's it's done so many times in this episode. It loses any effect. You're just like weary of it I mean, by the third the, time it happens. The problem is that it's just. I think the premise is okay. I just think it's a little thin for the length and, of one of these episodes. And, and, it is. Yeah, and then also I mean, like, the only, it wraps up so quick too. Like, and, and yeah, a lot of Star Trek episodes are guilty of this, t- but the conclusion is just kind of ridiculously quick. Uh-huh. And the tension, like Paul said, is really just about waiting to see who's got the it. next character that's going to get it. That doesn't really work, and it doesn't really sustain your interest that great. And it's kind of sad because there's an interesting little thread about prejudice woven into this because at first they think it's a Kardashian. A sabotage attempt that when the Cardassians left the space station that they left this virus behind but they find out through the investigation and shit that it's actually a Bajoran virus that was planted on the ship while the Cardassians, yeah, do the Cardassians. were still there and then it ends up blowing up in their faces because it didn't go off right and then chiefs you know whatever so that's an interesting little subplot and they, and they have some little fucking douchebag alien that's like I want to get out of here you know uh, if I did have to it, put it, it, it almost ends up destroying the station so they, have, right. they, have, they have that little subplot that kind of there just, was a, a silver lining is kind of interesting that uh, uh, you see you get to see Quark and uh, Odo working together in this episode and uh, it, the development of their relationship a little bit um, but I mean overall just not a hugely interesting premise no um, but not not a terrible episode in my opinion it's, it's worth just, watching I mean for continuity's a, sake and for character uh, development's you know, I mean, sake it's not awful but it's not like you know, it's not a great vehicle for any of the characters. Let's just say that if every episode it doesn't, were at this baseline level, you probably well, wouldn't. The problem is, it show. doesn't really help develop any of the characters. Really, it doesn't. It doesn't really. It doesn't move the story, the central story forward. It doesn't move any of the subplots forward. So you kind of just feel like, Filler. as it stands by itself, it just doesn't really work for what makes Star Trek great. You know, the, the, like Paul said, the, the the moral ambiguity, the themes that are, are running behind these episodes that are, you know, maybe co- coming on social commentary that uh, is applicable to modern times, well, the times we're living in. You know, there's none of that. It's just like, there's a disease. It's kind of like there's a disease episode and the disease is kind of lame. Yeah, it just makes you talk like a dork. So well, the, uh, the next episode... And the final one that we're going to cover the today. The final episode we're going to be talking about today is, uh, thankfully, a much better episode than the previous two weeks. This is discussed. a great episode. Uh, my favorite since the premiere. Uh, so this, this is, is my favorite of the first six. Captive Pursuit, 
where O'Brien uh, befriends an alien from the Gamma Quadrant uh, named Tosk. Who was actually being, the, the uh, first visitor from the Gamma yeah, Quadrant. He's actually, yeah, he's the first uh, alien from the Gamma Quadrant to visit through the wormhole going the other way. Um, so that's kind of an interesting little... There, there's really narrative. great tension in this episode, too. Um, and uh, Tosk is a really interesting character, uh, played brilliantly by Hillary Clinton here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, um, uh, he, he has... He, he You know, a lot of times in Star Trek, the aliens aren't very alien, but he does a very good job of portraying a genuinely alien sort of character who doesn't oblige social norms. Doesn't who, really get what's going on. Yeah, doesn't really seem to understand our culture. Has almost a naivete about him, but also kind of you can tell a little bit of judgment about the way we live because he lives such a utilitarian uh, existence that isn't based as much around pleasure and but that know, that cultural gulf between him and the rest of the station is two-way and it's at the heart of what makes yeah um you know uh, star trek a good series this is really one of those like how do we come to terms with people that are different than us episodes and um even though his intentions are really good uh, chief o'brien ends up doing some wrongs to tosk because as it turns out Tosk is a member of a race of people who have a subclass whose entire life exists just to be hunted by other members of their race. So, well, and the and the great thing too is how they build up the tension throughout the episode. You don't know that until about halfway through, right? So, Tosk is being hunted by this by these aliens, and O'Brien is trying to help him escape them. But really, he's doing a disservice to Tosk, whose entire life is wrapped up in getting away. Like, the farther he can run, the, the longer it takes for them to catch him. Um, if he forces them to kill him, then he's died an honorable death. And if he's just captured, then he has to go back in disgrace to his home planet. So really, this episode is about Chief O'Brien coming to terms with what's right and wrong, not really applying to alien species that we haven't contacted yet. And he does so by breaking the Prime Directive. Um, at the end of the episode, he helps Tosk escape, which redeems him as a Tosk and lets him keep his honor and makes the aliens that were pursuing him happy because all they want to do is have a good chase. So it kind of diffuses a diplomatic situation. But he had to go outside and, the, and an the rules way. of the Federation. Yeah. Right. He it. had to intervene in the affairs of an alien species at first contact, which is something that the Federation does not do. That's the prime directive. No, no, not at all. Um, so he actually helped this out, changed the course of events in this hunt, which is a very culturally significant thing to this new race. And he gets uh, kind of admonished for it at the end of the episode by Cisco who you can kind of tell is doing it because he has to. Well, I mean, it, it even ends with Cisco kind of smiling like he, well, Chief, he, just, it's clear approval. Chief right. O'Brien's kind of like at the end of it, like, you could have stopped me. And Cisco's just like, well, I guess we just yeah, overlooked. Must yeah, have been an oversight. And then he turns and, you know, smiles knowingly like, yeah, I actually facilitated this too and was part of this on a complicit level. But, you know. Well, that's, not, what, that's what I like. Is I'm that, not going to explicitly endorse it, but. Is even though these characters in, the, in a sense are both very like, this is we're the part of the Federation, these are the rules. They're not, they're, they're not unwilling to break the rules. Zisco will break the rules, and O'Brien definitely will break the rules if they feel that's what is necessary to do what's right. And they both do in this episode. Yeah, and their friendship is very cool. Uh, the friendship that develops between Tosk and O'Brien is uh, believable and cool, and you're almost sad to see Tosk uh, leave for the chase at the end of the yeah, episode. Yeah, even ask O'Brien, like, do you want to come? He's yeah. all like, no, nah, I'm good. I mean, you almost want O'Brien to go yeah. like, yeah, fuck the space station chasing fucking help tickets life. Let's go be fucking tossed together, bro. <laughs> but no, it doesn't happen that way, obviously. Uh, but a really good episode. I, I'd say the first really good episode <laughs> since the opener. Uh, I agree. I think it's of the episodes we watched, other than the amazing opening uh, two-parter, I think this is probably the strongest um, so, guys, uh, let us know what you thought about this concept. Uh, if you want to see more, I mean, we're going to get through the first season no matter what. But let us know if you want us to keep going beyond that. Yeah, we're thinking and, about making uh, this a weekly thing. So Support this. Give it a thumbs up if you really enjoyed it. Be sure to leave a comment uh, talking about whatever you, you think is relevant or interesting. Uh, if you know people who are into DS9, uh, maybe send it to them, share it around. Uh, you know, like I said, you know, if you want us to keep doing this, the best way for you to do that is to show it some love, show it some support any way you can. Um, and, uh, you know, this isn't... 
uh, you know, we're going to do other things on counterpoint list as well, but we thought this would be a nice thing to kind of focus on for a while. Um, and, uh, thank you guys for watching. We appreciate yep, thank it. You guys. Uh, let me just close this out by asking, uh, Paul, who's kind of, uh, new to the whole DS nine thing. What is your overall impression uh, about DS9 at this point. You even got a little further than the ones we talked about. Yeah, I'm a couple episodes ahead of us here. I'm really liking, in fact, one of my favorite, my favorite episodes so far comes, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it next week, but I really think that they've established the characters well. I'm way more interested than I thought I would be, and I've heard from you guys that it just gets better as the seasons wear on. So It really, does. It really truly does. I think that even if we don't end up covering this, you might want to keep going. I'm going to. I'm um, going all right, to. So thank you guys for watching, and uh, we will uh, see you next week with some more DS9 stuff. Uh, I'll also be putting out a review of... Uh, YouTube Red's Cobra Kai series tomorrow uh, on this uh, this channel as well. So stay tuned for that. Peace. Peace.